And you know, as I mentioned, the flexibility we're trying to create in our Sunday school program that your kids can be with you at any part of it. They can be with you for all of it too. So we're just uh, wanting to encourage our families and encourage you and thankful for all the Lord's doing in all of those ways. Well, it is a wonderful post-Thanksgiving and I hope that it was a wonderful time with your family and your friends. Our text this morning is uh, from the book of Jude. We're continuing on in our series, looking at Jude verses 14 through 16 today. So if you would take your copy of God's word and turn with me to Jude verse 14, that would be wonderful. Jude is an important study as it's, it's one of the most direct warnings for the church in the New Testament. And critical that we understand that. However, along with such strong warnings comes the necessary explanation for these admonitions. And in that explanation is a certain unsavoriness. And that something that we would like to avoid, but indeed we're unable to. Much like the suffering of this life on this sin-cursed earth and in these sin-cursed bodies. The result of this being sickness, moral failure, financial and emotional suffering, and ultimately death. All things that we would love to just avoid and not have to deal with, but indeed we do have to deal with them. And yet our world and our history is full of sin-cursed unsavoriness. Men like Hitler and Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, Leupold, Louis Mengele, and Saddam Hussein to name a few. And what we recognize is that there is a common element in all of these, and that element is the same which we see in Jude. And that element is ungodliness. And that is where our title comes from, What of These Ungodly? What of These Ungodly? Let's take a look at our text. I'm going to back up clear to verse 4 because this is all one unit of thought and read that for you. Follow along if you would in your copy of God's Word. Jude verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under the darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire." Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts, when they feast with you without fear caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It is also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way 
and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining advantage. What of these ungodly? Our theme is two devastating revelations to warn you about ungodliness. In the first three verses, Jude wrote, Jude wrote a wonderful introduction and acknowledgement of his desire to write a joyous and uplifting letter about the common salvation that he shared with the church. But he then explained the necessary task of exposing the tremendous danger lurking within the church in verse 4. He explains to us following that God's response of destruction upon the ungodliness of Israel, of angels, and of whole cities in verses 6 to 7. Verses 5 to 7, rather. Jude next describes their defilement and blasphemy in verses 8 to 13 as, as animalistic reviling of that which they are ignorant, of murderous, money-grubbing monsters unseen razor-sharp assailants against the congregation, the valueless, vain villains without substance, fruit, or hope, wild and shameless exiles and enemies of God and His church for whom the ultimate of destruction is reserved in the deepest fiery pit of hell. And now Jude takes us into the final section of these church-attacking apostates, to expose both their ruination and their identification. So let's go to our first point this morning, which I've titled, The What and the Why. The What and Why. The first thing for us to understand in verse 14 is the subject. Namely, who are these men? And the answer goes all the way back to verse 4. These are the licentious and immoral ones who have slipped into the church. These are men of wickedness directly linked to the idolatry of the nation of Israel. The ones on the same line as the wicked angels of Genesis 6 cast into eternal punishment. And the homosexually dominated cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Men who revile angelic powers they don't understand. Men akin to murderous Cain. And also the money-grubbing Balaam and the power-hungry Balak. These who attack the good and pure and right things of God in the church. Men of shame and worthlessness for whom God has reserved the most horrific judgment the place of deepest isolation, the hottest fires of hell, and the most heinous, grueling, and massive flesh-consuming worms, constantly eating the ever-regenerated flesh, allowing for continual consumption and burning, and with iron teeth that are able to continually gnash at their condition. Not a pretty picture. And yet exactly that which awaits those who are not true believers in Christ. And especially these church attacking apostates. This is the same term, these, which is, has occurred back in verse 8 and verse 10 and verse 12. And so now in verse 14, we have a connection to the previous 10 verses, but with a different perspective. That new perspective begins with a prophecy, and that is a prophecy from Enoch. And our first question is, who is Enoch? Well, the verse tells us that he is the man bearing the name Enoch, and that is in the seventh generation from Adam. We find Enoch described in Genesis chapter 5. He is the son of Jared, which is the sixth generation from Adam in Genesis 5.18. He is the father of Methuselah, who was the oldest living man at 969 years. Enoch is described as one who walked with God and was 365 years old when in God's good pleasure, he took him 
And that abbreviated text in Genesis is so powerful because that's all it says. And God was pleased with him and he took him. And we wonder, wow, what was that all about? The only place we get additional detail is in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. But neither in Genesis 5 nor Hebrews 11 where Enoch is mentioned, is there any reference to a prophecy of his? So where does this come from? The answer is in the extra-biblical book of Enoch. This is a non-canonical book, according to Hebert. It is a compilation of over a hundred chapters put into five separate divisions. Several works were combined in the early 2nd century B.C. to compose the book of Enoch. Enoch is not the author of every aspect of the hundred chapters of that book, but these details are associated with him throughout this book due to his obvious spiritual maturity as the only man other than Elijah to be translated from life to life and not have to go through death. The mentioned prophecy in Jude 14 is recorded in three places in combination in the book of Enoch. In Enoch 1.9, Enoch 5.4, and Enoch 27.2. However, despite its inclusion in this non-canonical book, it is nonetheless inspired scripture as it appears here in the text in Jude. It is further recognized as being passed down through the generations from Enoch so as to be included in the book of, e in the book of Enoch even if the rest of the book is not directly from him and also to be a divinely appointed in God's holy word. John Calvin notes that this is clearly the high antiquity of prophecy. R.C.H. Lenski notes that Jude is here directly quoting Enoch. There's much to commend this piece of extra-biblical literature as divinely inspired on this point and other points to discuss, but we need only recognize it is here in the book of Jude as Holy Spirit, plenary-inspired, inerrant, holy scripture. And that alone is sufficient. And that takes us to the what of our first point of the what and why. And that what is what is going to happen to these men who are the subject of these two first verses and our first point. The beginning of the what at the end of verse 14 is the second coming of Christ and his judgment. Specifically as it states, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. The term for thousands is the transliteration of the Greek word murios, which in English is where we get our word myriad. And you can hear that parallel, murios to myriad. And the word for holy ones is the plural of the Greek word hagios, which is translated as holy or holy ones, or even saints. And, and no, I'm not soliciting for our Greek class, but it is important that you understand these two words because they are what give us the interpretation of who is specifically addressed with Christ as these ten thousands of his holy ones. And we're going to see this as we move along. The coming of Christ and the, and the holy ones, the, the myriad or the thousands, is repeatedly described in Scripture. In fact, we see it all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 33, and verse 2. And in Deuteronomy 33 and 2, Moses said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. The designation in Deuteronomy is referring to his holy angels. And here are some of the verses where we see myriads of angels referenced. And notice the plethora of them. Something for you to take note of if you want to do a little study on your own. Not only Deuteronomy, Daniel 7.10, which we're studying Wednesday night. Matthew 16.27, Matthew 24.31, Matthew 25.31, Mark 8.38, 
2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and Hebrews 12, 22 all reference these thousands as angels and specifically do so through the use of the word myrios or myriad. However, the plural reference here leaves plenty of room for this to also include men or even be exclusively men. The term myriad only is only being used of angels in other scriptures and the term holy ones, hagios, is used of men in places like 1 Thessalonians 3.13 where it says, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Here, the term saints, hagios, is referring specifically to men. And we see other locations where these thousands refer specifically to men. And those are in places such as 1 Thessalonians 3.13, Colossians 3.4, and Revelation 19.14. Revelation, our familiar text where we see the Lord Jesus Christ coming on his white horse with a sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth and the thousands of holy ones that will accompany him, specifically in that text referring to men. And other texts where we see both men and angels as possible inclusions, those Zechariah 14.5, Revelation 5.11, and our text in Jude 14. And the mix of the word myriad associated with angels and holy ones associated with men indicates a blended cohort such that in the Lord's return, these myriads are to be understood as both the angelic realm and the redeemed church resurrected and returning to earth in that judgment. And a fascinating consideration in that. So the what is the coming of Christ and the heavenly cadre. And verse 15 takes us to the why. And it says in verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convict all ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Two reasons are given for this condemnation. The first is to execute judgment, and the second is to convict. The idea of judgment and to convict come parallel together, and the issue of judgment was introduced all the way back in Jude verse 4. And in Jude verse 4, we saw that these were long beforehand marked out for that condemnation. And it is there in that condemnation that we see the idea of judgment. So also, this same word occurs in verses 6 and 9. So judgment has been a continuous theme throughout our section in Jude. And the judgment being executed here as the first reason is the result of the second reason stated, which is because of their conviction. They are judged because they are convicted. Two repetitive elements are not to be missed in verse 15, and I'm sure in our two readings you've seen them keenly. The fourfold repeated element of the word all, and the fourfold repeated element of the word ungodly. Powerfully revealing to us all of these elements that are together and so emphatically stated in this verse. And it's here from where our title and theme arise. So what of the ungodly? Hebert notes that the term all as stressing the universality of judgment. All who will sin will be judged. And the term ungodly underlines the character of those judged. The first of the four repeated elements is the judgment upon all. Literally in the Greek, against all or down on all. It's just the hammer of God's judgment is falling upon sin and wickedness and these deeds of ungodliness. None will escape. None will be overlooked. 
There are no minor offenses. There are no venial sins. There is no inconsequential iniquities. Every sin is seen by God. The single and the smallest sin is enough to separate one from God for an eternal punishment in hell. And as that each sin is seen by God, and as a perfectly holy and just judge, every sin must receive its full and due penalty. One commentator notes, God is no man's enemy, but he is the sinner's opponent, not least in judgment. We see more of these repeated elements in the next phrase in verse 15. To convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds. The word convict, as one commentator notes, is is more than just bringing evidence. It is more than just a list of charges. It involves refuting the arguments of the guilty and establishing their guilt beyond all doubt to their own shame. There will be no ground to appeal the decision of the judge. When this conviction is brought, there will be, oh, no, but, 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 I didn't, I didn't know, but, uh, you know, if I'd have no, no excuses, this conviction will be full and complete. The four-time repeated ungodliness means that there is a complete absence of reverence towards God. One source defines the ungodly as those living without any regard towards religious belief or practice. As we've been going through the road trip to truth in our home groups, this is exactly what we're seeing of the world around us. A culture in which each one can have his own truth and they can be completely contrary to one another and still somehow be fine. No understanding of absolute truth as exists in God and in His Word. And this is why it's so important that we engage in these studies. Because we need to understand that culture because we're in it. And if we're going to interact, if we're going to be able to know what they're thinking and be able to talk to them about Christ, we better have some understanding of these views as crazy as they may sound to us. And it is this aspect of a life without regard for religious belief that is so common out there. Another dictionary calls this ungodliness general wickedness or neglect or violation of one's duties towards God. As God has placed in every man the understanding of who he is and has given consciences for us to recognize and to be convicted by our sin, we have an obligation towards him. And if we violate that obligation, then we are guilty and convicted as such. Verse 15 tells us the why is because of their ungodly works and words. The first element is their ungodly works or deeds. This is every action that proceeds from an unholy and unrepentant heart. The structure of this phrase shows us that this is not sins of omission, which they unintentionally fell into. These are godless deeds purposely engaged in to delight the sinner that are outpourings of their darkened heart and are inseparable from their condition of sin. The second element is all of the harsh talk which ungodly sinners spoke against him. That is against the judge who is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is defiant speech against Christ and against his demand upon each life with respect to our required submission to who we know he is and obedience to the truth of his word. Scripture speaks much about our speech In familiar texts like Ephesians 4.29, which tells us, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Unwholesome in Ephesians 4.29 is well translated as rottenness. 
Ephesians is referencing speech towards men, but Jude is talking of rotten speech towards God. In Colossians 3.8, Paul tells us that there is to be no abusive speech from our mouth. In Matthew 12.34, Jesus tells us that the source of harsh talk is our hearts, from which outflows all of the thoughts of man and the intentions of man. For it is here, beloved, in our hearts that this rottenness lies. The recognition of ungodly men is not only of thousands of years ago or in the past history. It is today with one who would stab four university students and leave them to die in our quiet little state. It is a store clerk who would open fire on his fellow employees. It is those who commit mass killings at schools. It is those who would kill and bury children. It is those who just last week set off two concurrent bombs in the holy city of Jerusalem filled with nails and shrapnel to inflict maximum amount of casualties and deaths and did so at a bus stop so as to take maximum toll on the most innocent and unattentive. And at the consideration of things, we recoil, and justly so. And we're tempted to think and even speak along with the psalmist, how long, O Lord, how long will the wicked prosper? But the what and the why help appease these cries. Because Christ is coming in judgment. And that is the what. And that judgment is against all ungodliness. And that is the why. So how do we understand who these ungodly are? Back in verse 4, it tells us that they crept into the church. They slimed in the side door unnoticed. So how do we know who they are? Well, our second point answers that question. And it is the who and why. The who and why. Look at verse 16 with me, if you would. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. The verse begins with the same designation we've seen throughout the section, these or these men. We saw it back in verse 8 and verse 10 and verse 12 and verse 14 and now in verse 16. So our entire section is tied together. These are the same individuals who we saw in verse 4, those marked out for condemnation, these certain persons. And next, we're given the first part of the who of our second point, that is, who they are. This is where Pastor Jim made reference at the end of his message last week. And there are five different identifications of who these godly are. And the first identification of who they are is grumblers. Grumblers. The Greek word is an onomatopoetic word. Onomatopoetic means a word whose sound conveys its meaning. Onomatopoetic is a fun word to say. Unless you're trying to say it in the pulpit, which you, it gets stumbled over about every time I say it. But it is an important word because the sound of the word conveys the meaning. There is a unique connection between the source language and the target language English. We see this in Hebrew with the word katz. Katz. It means to cut. You hear that in the sound? Katz. To cut. So also here in our Greek word, it is gagusmas. Can you hear the grumbling in that? Gagusmas, gagusmas, gagusmas. It's one who expresses their dis dissatisfaction by murmuring and grumbling rather than following the biblical admonition to be reconciled and directly address issues. These just sit back and complain. They murmur to others, causing strife and dissension and factions in the church. John 7, 12 well portrays this situation. 
as they speak about Jesus. It says, there was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying he's a good man, but others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads people astray. Can you hear it? Gagusmas, gagusmas, gagusmas. No, don't follow him. He's, he's purporting lies. He's just a man. He's from Nazareth. No, gagusmas, gagusmas. No, it is this murmuring that is ongoing. It is this false proclamation and these dissatisfaction. We also see a prohibition against grumbling in 1 Peter 4.9. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, without gagusmas. What an important reminder the holiday season as friends and family come in, as we host home groups and we're, oh, gagusmas, gagusmas, I don't want to do it. If I vacuum this carpet one more, gagushmash, gagushmash, gagushmash. <laughs> yes, I do the vacuuming in our house. The second identification of who they are in verse 16 is that they are fault finders. Fault finders. The word also translated as malcontents or complainers. One who is constantly dissatisfied. Principally, this dissatisfaction is with their lot in life and with God's will in that respect. Practically, this works itself out in the church by complaining against God's chosen leaders and their actions. These are the ones who find a bone in every piece of fish. And no matter how sweet that fish is and how well prepared, they just want to complain about that bone. Things are going well in most of the church, but there's that one thing that bugs them, and so they're going to complain, and they're going to grumble, and they're going to moan, and they're going to cause dissensions and division. It cannot be. The third description takes us to the why. That is, why they are so defined. And the first why of why they are so defined is because they are following after their own lusts. Following after their own lust. This phrase indicates a self-directed plan of action which is in accord with one's sinful desires. Rather than obedience to God's word, they are self-deceived by their sin and craving. They have deluded themselves into thinking that their lusts and passions are what they deserve and what they should have. And so, because of their unmet sinful expectations, they complain against the godly actions others are pursuing within the church and as they pursue Christ. And this is all from dissatisfaction with their sinful expectations. And this, beloved, is the same condition for every addict and every addiction. They cannot and they will not ever satisfy and those so enslaved pursue ever greater satisfaction in that which cannot provide fulfillment. I need a stronger or I need more cigarettes. I need a stronger drug or alcohol. I need a bigger shopping spree, a more extravagant meal, a more extreme passionate pursuit. Commentator Alfred Plummer notes, Men who walk after their lusts and shape their course in accordance with these cannot be contented. For the means of gratifying the lusts are not always present. And the lusts themselves are insatiable. Even when gratification is possible, it is only temporary. The unruly desires are certain to revive and clamor once more for satisfaction. This is the horror of those following after their own lusts. The next why in verse 16 is their mouths are speaking arrogantly. Or as the ESV states, they are loud mouth boasters. I love that phrase. John MacArthur notes they speak pompously and even magnificently but with empty, lifeless words of no spiritual value. The word translated arrogantly means swelling words or big talk. These are, as Heber notes, focusing attention on their bombastic public utterances that are 
like verses 4 and 8, repudiating God's divine authority in their lives. Fifth in our list is that they are flattering people for the sake of gain. Rather than exalting God as above all, they are denying Him and instead exalting themselves and people. And they are doing so so that they may gain advantage. These men set themselves up as authorities and rather than proclaiming God's moral law, they set that aside to endear the others to themselves so that they can take advantage of the generosity of some to support their own livelihood. And this isn't exclusively in teaching. These show, as one commentator notes, warm interest in others to help them, but only so as they might exploit them. These are the charlatans who deceive the church, the savage wolves seeking only to devour No greater scriptural example exists other than Judas Iscariot, grumbler, fault finder, pursuing his own lusts, speaking arrogantly, flattering for gain. Listen to John 12, verses 4 to 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box. He used to pilfer what was put into it. Every one of these five attributes fulfilled in Judas in this one scene. Grumbler, fault finder. Gagusmas, why was that perfume sold? Why was that, all that money wasted? The, the grumbler and fault finder, the lustful. He was a thief. And he's pursuing his own thievery to satisfy his own lusts. Arrogant speech, as if to win the others over and to condemn the Savior and the act of this woman anointing him for burial, for which she was to continually be acknowledged. Flattering for gain. That's why he brought this forward, for his own personal increase. Spurgeon says of Judas, The murder of our blessed Lord was the extreme of human guilt. It developed the deadly hatred against God which lurks in the heart of man. When man became a deicide, sin had reached its fullness. And in the black deed of the man by whom the Lord was betrayed, that fullness was all displayed. My brethren, we should feel a deep detestation of the master of infamy. He has gone to his own place and the anathema of David, part of which was quoted by Peter, has come upon him. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. This is vile indeed to be chosen to such a position, to be installed purse bearer to the king of kings, chancellor of God's exchequer, and then to turn aside and sell the Savior. This is treason in its uttermost degree, end quote. And it is here that we see such an expression of ungodliness, And yet, what is ungodliness? The word in itself is an opposite, or or what grammarians call an alpha privative. That is where an A is added to the front of the word to show that its meaning now is the exact opposite. We know it from words such as amoral. To be moral is to act morally, to live rightly. To be amoral is to live completely without any moral standard. The word agnostic, gnostic meaning to have knowledge, and agnostic, one without knowledge. The word atheist, a theist, one who would seek after an understanding of God, an atheist, one who is in complete denial of God. And so here with our word ungodly, the Greek word is usobeia, which is defined as a life of reverence toward God and pursuing piety. Ungodly is the word asabeah, which is the alpha privative of usabeah, and it is defined as a life with no reverence for God and pursuing impiety or a sin to the fullest extent. 
And we don't even need to consider men like Judas or Hitler or Mao or Saddam. For Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And we recognize ungodliness in our state, in our day, and all the time around us. But beloved, this is not just a commentary on history and on our world. It is a commentary on us. This is why our theme is two devastating revelations to warn you about ungodliness. Because ungodliness and sin lie in the heart of every man. Jeremiah proclaims this in Jeremiah 17, 9, where he says, The heart is more deceitful than all else, and it is desperately sick. Who can understand it? We again turn to Spurgeon in his message on Judas. Surely as the devil was allowed unusually to torment the bodies of men, even so was he let loose to get possession of Judas, as he has seldom gained possession of any other man that we might see how foul, how desperately evil is the human heart. You and I have often betrayed Christ. We have, when tempted, chosen the evil and forsaken the good. We have taken the bribes of hell and have not followed closely with Jesus. Beyond a doubt, however, the main reason for this was that Christ might offer a perfect atonement for sin. And most surely, beloved, this is the answer to all of the issues of this message and to all of life. What of the ungodly? The answer is Jesus coming to judge. He will judge the greatest of sin with perfect equity and judgment, and he will judge the least sin with equal perfect equity and justice. What of the ungodliness of every man's heart? The answer is that Jesus has come to save. He has come to offer the free gift of salvation to every man. This is the gift offered to you today, my friend. If you do not know Jesus as Savior, then today is the day of salvation. And you must choose what you will do with this offer from this man who is God called Jesus of Nazareth. And to not choose is a choice because there is no fence sitting in this discussion. Scripture tells us this in 1 John 3.10 where the apostle says, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. No third option. You here today, you listening online, and everyone on this planet is in one of two camps. You are children of God, or you are children of the devil. You're one who follows after the truth of God's word, or you're one who hates God's word. God has sent his son, born of a virgin in human flesh, to live a sinless life and to die a sacrificial death for our behalf, for all who would come to him. He is calling you today to bow your knee to him as God, to bow to him as Lord and master of your life, and to humbly submit in obedience to his word. This through agreeing with God's pronouncement that you are a sinner and that your sin makes you guilty of eternal punishment in hell. But receiving in exchange for this sin, His free gift of salvation, His righteousness of which we have no right nor part except through His sacrificial death and through the power of His Holy Spirit living the rest of your life in obedience to Him. This is the answer to ungodliness. This is the answer as to how you can be saved from the wrath to come of Jesus and ten thousands of his holy ones coming to execute judgment on all the ungodly and wicked who have not accepted Christ as Savior. 
This is the only answer as to how your sins can be forgiven. There are not many ways to the top of the mountain. There are not many paths to salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one comes to the Father but through me. We must grasp Christ as our Savior. And so the question of our sermon is, what of these ungodly? But the question of our application is, what of you? And how will you be protected from sin and ungodliness? And the only answer is Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that you know this answer and that if you do not, that you will find it today. If you don't know this truth, there are elders and deacons and church leaders all around you. And there is nothing we would rather do. There is nothing more important in our life, nothing more critical in our schedule today or any day than to sit with you and tell you about the glorious truths of Jesus Christ came to earth to die for sinners like you and like me. So please, if you don't know that, come and speak with us. Come and join with one of our leaders and recognize that the only answer for ungodliness is Jesus Christ and that it is His desire that you would come to know Him today. Father, we thank You for Your words. Lord, they are powerful and strong and they, they cut us to the quick, Lord, for we know that we are sinners. Father, I am a sinner. My brothers and sisters and others who are here with us today, those watching online, we all fall short of Your glory every day. Forgive us, Father, for the darkness in our hearts. Strengthen us against our sin. Help us, Lord, in the power that you provide through your spirit to repent and turn from these things, not so that we might seen, be seen as holy or as anything, but so that people might see you. Lord, we pray you would strengthen us to live a life of obedience so that that beautiful communion, communion and fellowship which we can have with you is unhindered by our sin. Strengthen us, Lord, that as we grow in these things, we would recognize that we must be proclaimers of your truth. We must be those who speak your name. For the world of ungodliness is all about us. And yet, Lord, you have come to die for this ungodly world. So help us to live for you and to proclaim your name. And Father, through our efforts, weak as they may be and failing, May you be pleased to bring those to yourself whom you have chosen from before the foundations of the earth. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together today to think about these things, to ponder our own hearts, to recognize your grace and your glory, and to seek to honor you in all that we do. And we pray you would accomplish these things in each of our lives, and we ask it in the holiest name, whichever we will know nor speak, that of Jesus Christ our Lord.